It's great to be here. I was just commenting to Laura that uh, I, haven't, I haven't actually been in this auditorium for, for quite a while, but I do remember coming when it was, uh, when it was first open and been at many, many conferences uh, here. Um, as the, uh, I'm, I'm sort of fresh off the plane, and, and as the AV person was clipping on the, uh, uh, the microphone, he pointed out I was still wearing my top coat, and, and so, <laughs> so uh, it's either that or a T-shirt, uh, and I guess you're going to get the former. Um, okay, so uh, I'm, I'm going to be talking um, uh, about a, a topic of, uh, of resolution and the importance of resolution at, at, at two completely uh, opposite ends of the spectrum um, in looking at uh, the genome and genome function. Much of the talk is going to focus around um, uh, technology and um, sort of the principles of its, of its application to different problems. Um, I'm going to divide the talk into two sort of halves. Uh, one of them I'm going to call the read half, and the other one is the, uh, the write half. Uh, in the first half, I'm going to focus um, very precisely on, uh, just one second here, I'm getting a notice my computer is running out of battery. Um, I'm, going to I'm going to take a step back and focus on the nucleotide resolution uh, visualization of regulatory information on the genome and its intersection with genetic variation. And I'm going to talk about this at, at a, just a very uh, sort of a basic level um, to take one through uh, this picture. So we have had a succession of technologies over the last you know, 10 or 12 years, um, uh, and you know, and during this time, uh, you know, the world has moved from Sanger sequencing now to you know to uh, uh, to large scale single molecule sequencing, uh, and um, there were many early successes that kind of brought together the streams of genetic variation and its association with common disease and genome regulation. And these streams, which were largely evolving independently prior to about 20, uh, 2012, crossed it around that time uh, and with uh, 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 various major consortia pulling all these things together. And, um, uh, and since then, there has been quite a lot of, uh, of work. And, and, and what has happened in, in the interim is that uh, the genetic studies have proceeded uh, inexorably. Um, the the uh, populations have gotten larger. The signals have become far more numerous and uh, and more sharp. Um, and one of the uh, uh, key things that uh, we are confronted with today um, is that there is an enormous amount of. Uh, variation out there. So we have now this stream of human, uh, 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 human whole genome sequencing has dumped, you know, enormous numbers of variants uh, in, in, into the public domain. We have uh, all of these uh, large numbers of variants that are uh, associated with, with diseases. Uh, and we have a profusion of um, sort of epigenomic, regulatory genomic data. Um, and what I'm going to do is just kind of focus in on uh, one data type, which is uh, the, the one that uh, um, my lab has, uh, has focused on for a number of years, which, uh, which is looking at uh, uh, using the DNAs1 molecule uh, as, as a probe, uh, essentially, of the structure of uh, regulatory G DNA in the genome. And um, gonna, those data also have been constantly uh, improving and increasing in size um, and scope. And uh, also our methods of trying to understand what, what those data tell us uh, have, been, uh, have been changing. As Doug pointed out, the application of those, that type of technology and, and others to a, a wide variety of biological problems, differentiation, development, et cetera, uh, is, uh, is ongoing and, and there's uh, lots of exciting work there. But I'm going to just drill back and kind of get back to basics a little bit um, and sort of look at uh, what the, where the technologies are now and how it integrates with, uh, with genetic variation. Okay, so um, on, this, uh, on this read side in regulatory genomics, uh, I, I am going to focus uh, principally on genomic footprinting, um, which uh, essentially is a nucleotide resolution window on gene regulation. Um, and, and everybody is uh, familiar with, uh, you know, with the concept that uh, the genome is packaged into, into chromatin and, uh, uh, and, and 
you know, aside from the nucleosomes, and you're probably going to hear tons of things about uh, lots of other components uh, 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 here, but, but I'm, I'm going to be focusing on these uh, regions, which I'm generically going to call regulatory DNA. These are, are relatively short, you know, a couple few hundred base pair sequence elements uh, in, in the genome, um, which encode recognition sites for uh, transcription factors. Um, Wouter Muleman is going to be uh, giving a, a talk at, at some point later in this meeting um, talking about uh, the large-scale uh, comprehensive integration uh, of all of the um, uh, information uh, from all of the DNA seq data that have accumulated in uh, now in, in major consortia and encode roadmap, et cetera, uh, to really provide a very precise delineation uh, of these elements uh, and a reference index uh, of them in, in the human genome. Uh, and there are a lot of them. Uh, there are millions um, that can be really, really uh, precisely defined and, and have lots of properties in terms of their cellular uh, context and behavior, which turn out to be incredibly powerful for, uh, for internal interpreting features of, uh, of common disease. Um, but, but if you drill into these, uh, these regions, you've got these, uh, these little uh, uh, play toys there, the, uh, the, the transcription factors. And, um, and, and so the way we see this and the way we look at this now is we, we take the, we, uh, you, know, you can take a, the enzyme like DNAs1 that, that can come in and just break, sort of blow these regions up uh, into little fragments. You collect the fragments, you sequence them, you map them to the genome, uh, and, and you get a bunch of peaks, right? So this is just from a couple of cell types, little region of genome, and, 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 and these peaks are, uh, are the DNA's hypersensitive sites, and, and I'm just going to generically refer to these as, as the regulatory DNA um, out there. And if we zoom into one of these uh, peaks, this is where uh, our transcription factors friends are, 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 are hiding, um, and, uh, and if we sequence deeply and, and map the, um, uh, the cleavage uh, sites to the genome, what we find is that this enzyme, uh, DNAs1, uh, is essentially avoiding the transcription factors when it's, when it's cleaving uh, the genome uh, and, and leaves behind these transcription factor footprints. Okay, so, th so this is a, a concept now that is, uh, that is quite well established. Um, and if we take this, uh, take this technology and look at it you know, generically, um, you know, the, this DNA-seq and genomic footprinting, so DNA-1 really is, you know, has been the gold standard for many, many years, decades, uh, really, for, uh, for DNA uh, accessibility and also for the integration of, uh, of GWAS and genetics data uh, in terms of the, uh, uh, the breadth and sharpness of the, of the signal. Um, and, you know, and it's also been uh, shown now by, by, by many groups that uh, the majority of trait heritability is, uh, is concentrated in uh, the variants that are in DNA hypersensitive sites. Um, one advantage of this approach is it gives you true nucleotide resolution, <clears throat> and I'm going to say something about that uh, uh, coming up, um, and, and, and it also really gives you com essentially complete base coverage uh, of, of the regulatory DNA, um, and, and really that's what you need for variant level analyses. Um, the other thing about this is that when you, when you do one of these experiments, and, and you, get these, you get these peaks, what you're essentially doing at that time is piling a whole bunch of reads on the genome, and you're effectively resequencing that spot in the genome. Um, and, and, and that act has many uh, advantages, because you can then start looking at how different variants are, are, are handled in the, in the sequencing operation. Let me just pass this. Oops. Uh, and, um, and, and so that, and I'm going to come to what, what the utility of that information is, and it has been accumulating quite dramatically in the sense that there's a very big difference between the genomic data sets, even if I took a DNAs1 experiment and I did it in 2012 and I do it now, uh, the, and let's say I generate two data sets of equivalent quality, et cetera, the biggest difference between the data from, you know, five or seven years ago and today is that today's data are 10 or 20 times or sometimes 50 times deeper. And, and and that means that they are vastly more information rich uh, in terms of what you can get out of it. Um, and, then, uh, and then the final thing is that, is that this is a, a, a relatively unbiased approach. Not relatively, it is, it is an unbiased approach in the sense that it's, you know, we've figured out how to correct for all of the various preferences that are out there uh, in, in terms of the sort of the sampling and nibbling of the genome, um, you know, by, by this relatively nonspecific enzyme. 
And, and so kind of focusing in on, on, on this uh, feature, which I mentioned, is that really unmatched uh, feature is this nucleotide resolution. And also, in principle, allows, assuming you have enough complexity in your, uh, in your libraries, uh, it allows you to uh, analyze uh, potentially hundreds of thousands of uh, transcription factor to DNA binding events within the regulatory DNA of any uh, cell experiment. Um, and you know, previously we had, had published the fact that if you have uh, uh, data from from many uh, from say several different cell types, and so you know, here's a few cell types, and and here's a you know, transcription factor is just is parked on the DNA and blocking the enzyme, and then you go to brain and uh, uh, different kinds of uh, uh, brain, and, and and the factor's gone, uh, and 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 this is uh, you know, factor NRSF, and it's associated with with the expression of this particular gene we're looking at. Um, and so one of the differences before is that we didn't really have have very good approaches for doing di what I call differential footprinting. Uh, but that problem now has been, uh, uh, has been solved by, uh, uh, by, by Jeff Veerstra, uh, and uh, um, it, it's, uh, well, there'll be forthcoming publications on this, and there's also a description in a sort of a, the principle in a review in, in, in Nature Methods from a, uh, from a couple of years ago, but the bottom line is now you can sort of scan across the genome and figure out all the places where the, the various factors are, are, are changing. Um, but what I want to do is just talk about the kind of the footprints um, th themselves. Okay, so when we, when we go and we look at a, uh, um, a region of genome, and this is just DNA, uh, DNA accessibility in, in, um, uh, in some T cells, and there's a peak there, and there's, you know, a promoter and, and, and something, you know, a little site next to it. And I zoom in. Um, now, I'm going to zoom in now to nucleotide uh, resolution, uh, and then these are the peaks. Um, and so this, this observed is actually the cleavages that I see. Uh, and then the, uh, the background here, this gray, are the cleavages that I would expect at that uh, position. And we know that because DNAs1 is an enzyme that now has been completely modeled. Uh, it has had, you know, all of its cleavage preferences are known. What this thing does is it docks into the minor groove of DNA, and it essentially cleaves DNA uh, in, in proportion to the width of that minor groove. And all of this has now been measured exhaustively so that you can construct a complete model, uh, a computational model based on exhaustive em uh, uh, empirical data for what this thing should be doing at a position in the genome. And what that allows you to do now is to very statistically rigorously go across, and, and without going into the details of it, to, to define uh, footprints that are uh, where, this, where these things are deviating. And this is just one snapshot in one cell type. But now, fast forward to, to 20, uh, 2019 here, um, now we have lots and lots of data from lots and lots of cell types. And if I take this same region here, uh, and this gene happens to be on a lot of cell types, and I look across all those cell types, and now instead of, uh, of having one cell type represented like this, I'm just going to represent it as a single pixel row. So here's now 297 different cell types, and, and what I'm showing here then is just the uh, occurrence of the cleavages and where they are, and so, and, or sorry, of the, of the footprints, the, so, uh, so the, the, the sort of the deviation here uh, and where it is. So the, these, these spots now are, 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 you can see them, are, are sort of tracking at, uh, down and, um, and are very consistent. And what this allows you to do is to integrate all of this information and, and get a really sharp picture of where the transcription factor contacted nucleotides are in the genome. Um, and now, granted, there's a bunch of differential behavior here, right? So, so here there's a, a, the footprint stronger, here it goes away in this cell type. But if you integrate over lots and lots of cell types, uh, then you can get a really precise picture of where the information is. Uh, and so Jeff has actually um, uh, uh, compiled this into a, a consensus index of all the DNA's footprints. Uh, and this is uh, going to be available, uh, I think it's up, I'm not entirely sure though, but, but uh, that if it's immediately up, but it, it will be extremely shortly, if not um, through the uh, through the ENCODE um, uh, portal for, for distribution. Uh, and, and the nice thing about these consensus footprints that are made from the TF, sort of the TF, you know, the really uh, uh, precise TF contacted nucleotides is that they line up so amazingly well with the recognition sites for transcription factors that you can unambiguously uh, assign a huge number of them. Um, and I should also mention uh, that, that 
you can also take slices here. So if we go and we take a slice that is, happens to be where the first few cell types coming across here happen to be all from, uh, uh, from lymphoid cells, you know, I can take a slice here, these are, you know, here's CD8 and here's a bunch of other lymphoid cells, uh, and, and I can do the same operation just within lymphoid cells, and again, I can find, uh, you know, sort of lymphoid factors, et cetera, that are, uh, uh, that are coming out. Okay, so, so now this, this technology exists. There's enormous amounts of data uh, that, are, that are out there and more are accumulating uh, at, at a fairly alarming rate. Uh, they will probably, I would guess, double in the next year uh, at the rate things are, are, are going with, uh, with ENCODE and other, and other projects. Um, and the other thing about this is that you can push this, uh, anal this type of analysis experimentally down to, to relatively small numbers of cells. Um, you can actually get this data, so uh, uh, in this case, um, uh, th these data right here uh, were generated from about, I don't know, somewhere between 500,000 and a million cells, uh, and, and you know, this is the same uh, uh, then generated from about 25,000 cells, and it's about 100 million reads, 200 million reads, and this is generated from uh, just 1,000 cells, uh, and there's only 32 million reads in this particular uh, uh, sample. Um, but, but the basic idea is that when you have, you know, you still maintain uh, extremely highly complex libraries that allow you to drill in uh, and, and, and allow you to see things, and particularly when you have a reference index of footprints. Now, it kind of changes the game because it shifts away from the question of, can I find everything de novo? And now it shifts to the question of, you know, is, am I detecting A or B? And I think this is just generally in the whole area of regulatory genomics. This is a very, we're, we're kind of at a tipping point right now where an enormous amount has been discovered. Uh, and by moving to a framework of having a, a, of reference indices, then it changes again from a, a, a period period of discovery to, to, to a period of detection. Okay, so this is uh, the kind of footprint that, that you see here, but I, I do want to make some caution in terms of, of looking at, uh, at footprinting data, um, because, you know, the principle of why you can get this information uh, out of DNA's data has to do with the fact that it is uh, behaving independently and it is sampling every position and so you can get a reliable picture. But, but it turns out that there's a lot of uh, things that are increasingly coming up in, in the literature uh, with, some, with somewhat alarming frequency uh, that are claiming that footprint type of phenomena can be, uh, can be discovered in other data types. And when you actually look closely at them, you find out that, that, that's, uh, that that's not the case, and it can be greatly misleading, particularly when you try to dial in uh, genetic variation. So this is, uh, I'm going to call this phenomenon the great footprint caper because in some way it's something that is extremely difficult for somebody who is not in the know to, to suss out in terms of figuring out what's actually going on. Um, and so, but I do want to walk you through, uh, uh, walk you through this um, because it is something that, that uh, I think ha knowing about it, I think with any assay, every assay, no matter what it is, has, has advantages and limitations. And I think it's extremely important that one knows you know, th that and, and the trade-off, um, uh, particularly in, in generating and analyzing uh, DNA accessibility data. Okay, so if I, if I go back to what we uh, were just looking at here, um, and so this is you know, a tract from about a million cells. Uh, this is a tract from, uh, made from 25,000 cells. Um, and again, it's very high complexity and every nucleotide is generated. And this is using the DNAs one enzyme, little 30 kilodalton thing that's coming in and sampling the genome. Well, it turns out if you take for the same cell type here, at the same sample even, and I generate data looking at uh, transposase accessibility of the, of the DNA, uh, and I do the same number of reads, and I have the same rough level of, uh, of enrichment, and I look in one of these regions, in fact, this exact region, uh, this is what I get, okay? And, and what you get is actually uh, a very low complexity sample, um, and you have relatively sparse uh, insertion sites. So not every, so over here, right, this is a, a quite striking comparison, that, that you have essentially blockage uh, or, or, or preferences uh, against the sampling uh, of a large number of the nucleotides. Um, and basically what, what the theme is, is that TN5 insertions actually violate uh, the fundamental assumption of footprinting, uh, which, is, which is independent. 
independence. Um, and the reason for this has to do with a phenomenon uh, of, of how this transposase works um, that was actually published in the late 90s, believe it or not, uh, with, uh, in, in, in PNAS and a couple of papers uh, looking at the binding of, the, uh, uh, of this element. Um, of this transposase to its, uh, to its substrates. So it's very um, a unique type of, uh, it's not really actually an enzyme, because what it does is it actually binds to its reaction products with higher affinity uh, than it does to the, the initial uh, uh, reactants. Um, and that creates some, some kind of unusual behavior. And, and one of the key pieces of this behavior is that when you're DNA1 and you're attacking DNA, you're looking at that minor group and you're sort of seeing everything and you're not having any kind of biases for, per strand. But, but it turns out that when, you're, when you look at, say, at TN5 data, um, and, and you look at the different strands, what you notice is that with some degree, some offset, uh, it turns out that there is a, a very high correlation between the strands. And so if you look at this region, say, with, uh, with DNAs1, um, you're, you're not really getting any uh, strand correlation. But then with, with, uh, with the transposase, you get this really sharp peak uh, at nine base pairs. So it means that there's this nine base pair at a nine base pair offset, suddenly these strands are correlated with each other. And this has to do with the way that this, uh, that the transposase is actually uh, inserting. Now, this problem is, is uh, uh, if it were relatively mild, it would be one thing, but it turns out that, the, um, that as you go from the least accessible regions in the genome to the most accessible, the strand correlation increases quite dramatically. So to the point when you are actually in regulatory DNA and promoters, enhancers, et cetera, you have strand correlations that are, six, you know, that are 0 0.6, 7, 8, sometimes 0 0.9. And what that means is you cannot tell which strand or an insertion supposedly read came from. You just can't do it because you can't tell. The transpose they start at the bottom and the top. And if, so if you don't have that, you can't actually get footprints out of the data. And, and so this is, there are other ways to see this too. So for example, if we take now, you know, uh, 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 thousands of, uh, of, uh, of instances of a, um, uh, of, of a motif of a transcription factor, ELK1, and I'm gonna look across all the hypersensitive sites in that sample that I just showed you. Uh, this is, uh, and this is actually, you know, data again from about 25,000 cells. Um, and then I'm just gonna, I'm going to rank the, uh, the DNA cleavages around these motif instances uh, uh, so that, and, and rank these by, um, uh, by the degree of, uh, of footprinting or blocking of the nucleotides. Now here what you see, you see these little stripes appearing. What these stripes are is the cleavage preferences of the enzyme itself. And those are the things that we now have completely cataloged, and, and we can we can uh, uh, and we can uh, and we can account for. But this is just literally DNA structure that you're seeing uh, uh, down here. And then note these numbers here. We're looking at about plus or minus 20 nucleotides. Um, and so again, up here we essentially have occupied motifs where there's no cleavage, uh, and down here we have unoccupied motifs where you're just looking at the intrinsic DNA structure as it's being seen by the little enzyme. Okay, so if we do TN5 transposase and we do the same exercise, what we see is there's not much difference between uh, the top and the bottom here. Um, and, 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 but you do see this stripe down the middle, but that stripe you see uh, is actually due to a GC bias in the uh, preference for, uh, for insertion. And, and if we take now the top 20% most occupied sites, and we take the 20% least occupied sites, and we look at, say, the DNAs1 signal in those sites, um, you know, what you find here is that, you know, in the unoccupied sites, the enzyme can get in, and in the occupied sites, uh, the enzyme is blocked. And so it's essentially the, the phenomenon I was showing earlier. And I just want to distinguish this, because you see plots uh, of, these, of these types. These are, are, are aggregating now thousands of instances of motifs. They're not actually footprints. footprints are when a, a, a protein touches the DNA at a specific spot in the genome between this base and that base, and you can actually see it there uh, of the type of things I was showing you earlier. So in an aggregate plot, though, it's useful for showing this. But now if we do the same exercise here for TN5, that's what we get, okay? So 
And, and you can do this for other factors, you know, so here's SP1, and, and you know, which is you know, quite dramatic in here. And again, here they're just sort of tracking uh, along. And there are sometimes these kind of flanking features here, but, but those really have to do with, uh, with uh, sort of, they're kind of artifacts of the way that the strands are correlated uh, and come out, and they're not really features of the, uh, uh, of, of, of the chromatin. And, and so what this leads to is this kind of phenomenon um, where people sort of assume that these data might contain footprints, and then you go in the literature and you see lots of figures that look like this, okay? And, and what this is is basically ostensibly showing kind of transposase insertions across uh, many different, uh, sort of in this case, five or six different kinds of cell types uh, and claiming that there is a footprint going on. Well, one of the things that you should, one recognizes immediately is the scales here, right? So the footprints you can, should be able to see on a scale of plus or minus 20 base pairs, not plus or minus 200 base pairs. And so what this is actually uh, uh, doing is basically just showing you the aggregate cleavage of like if I just took a DNA and just looking at the amplitude, the overall amplitude of cleavage in this broad region uh, in different cell types. Yeah, of course it changes, because uh, that's, that's when regulation happens. But when you drill in, you don't really see anything. And, and so, um, so it's a kind of thing where, you know, interestingly, here's this sort of observed versus, uh, versus expected and, um, that, is, that is plotted under there, but it's kind of, you know, kind of, kind of hidden. Uh, but, but there's a lot of that out there uh, in, in, in terms of the figures uh, that, that are being propagated, but these are not footprints uh, of any kind. Um, and, and to the extent that you actually do see any depression in, in the cleavage, which if you zoomed in here, you would, what you are actually seeing there is the, is the it's, it's like the footprint of the transposase itself. It essentially footprints itself when it jumps into, when it lands on the genome and, 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 uh, and, and kind of does its insertion reaction. Okay. So uh, now, back with that uh, very important caveat aside, uh, I want to get back on track and talk about analysis of genetic variation. So where I left you off was uh, with, with this figure and the fact that you can integrate information uh, across a lot of cell types and the fact that the data are re are can be now, even within a cell type, can be, can be quite deep. Okay, so what that allows you to do is, is to effectively resequence the sites. And so, um, and, and aggregate things across samples. So now if I go and let's say I've got a, a, a particular spot and I've got a SNP and, um, and I can take, in this case, I've got 50 something samples that have had DNA uh, that have been done. Um, and out of those we can read and we can find that, uh, uh, that this is a, a heterozygous position. So these are 52 heterozygotes in a, in, uh, in, in, in a sample. Um, these are where the consensus footprints are. I'm just blocking everything else out to focus in here. Uh, and there are two alleles. And what we find if we look at all the reads uh, is that, um, that, the, that the reads with the C allele look like this, which is unoccupied, and the, and the reads that have a G allele uh, look like this is, unoccupi is occupied. And I should mention that the occupied doesn't mean there's like a, just a monomorphic flat spot. Uh, what, what it means is that there's you know, going to be some structure in there because all the transcription factors engage uh, differently with the DNA. Um, and then if we look in the, in the sequence here, we find that you know, it's an NFIX site, and, and the variant happens to be at this, uh, at this spot. And, and so, and so those, are, those are the heterozygotes. But then, you know, we can also then look across and pull out individuals who are homozygous. And so here's, you know, 56 homozygotes um, uh, that, that are homozygous for, for the, the C allele and 16 that are homozygous for the G allele. And you can see that here again that the, uh, that the homozygotes are, are kind of uh, uh, having the same pattern as the, uh, uh, as the hets are, but now they're completely separated and these alleles are behaving uh, in the chromatin context are behaving independently. Um, and you can, of course, go and, 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 and identify these, uh, these phenomena uh, uh, rigorously. It turns out that then if you took all of these spots, so what these are now, are chromatin altering variants. So this is a, this is a variant that, that when it is present, when there's a G allele, uh, it, depending on how you want to look at it, the G allele is, is 
uh, essentially cr either uh, creating the occupancy uh, uh, at, or, you know, but I'll get back to it in a second, uh, you know, you can look at the ancestral picture, but you essentially have a variant that is a single variant that is modulating the binding of a transcription factor. So this is a functional variant, uh, and it's a variant that, that is it, functional in the sense it's doing something that we can, we can measure, uh, and, um, uh, and, and we're measuring it out of chrominin, so we like to call these chrominin altering variants. So if you sum all of these across all these samples, what you can then do is you can create uh, a, a picture here by looking at, at SNPs that are, are, are uh, imbalanced, and I can literally just look on a base-by-base -base position relative to the, to the recognition sequence of this transcription factor, and I can sort of ask which of the bases are, 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 are being footprinted or not footprinted, and what this allows you to do is to, uh, and, then, and then look at, um, uh, and look at sort of the percent imbalance. So that's the thing you really want to follow, is that, that, that essentially as you come to the important base then you start to now, in these you know, large data sets we have, uh, to be able to go and, and to actually pick out the important bases which match up with the recognition sequences on the basis of their functional effects on, uh, on, um, uh, on chromatin and factor binding. And, and so this is like a whole other layer that, that really now can systematically be, uh, be, be pulled apart. And in terms of figuring out you know, what things are doing, um, so here we have our same, uh, our same variant, um, and since we know the ancestral allele, you know, we can see basically that, that we can separate things into kind of gain of binding uh, or, or loss of binding. And I don't have a figure here to show you, but one of the remarkable things is if somebody would have asked me uh, previously, what, what's your bet? Are most of these variants going to be deleterious in the sense that they're interrupting binding? Uh, or, or they're going to be creating new binding sites. I would have thought maybe 80-20, something like that. It turns out that it's almost 50-50 in terms of the variants that are out there. There's a slight preference for, for, for a variants that, that abrogate binding, but, but there's a lot of variation out there that is actually creating new functionality uh, in the sense, and sometimes it's extreme in the sense that sometimes you find a variant that create, that effectively you know, either wipes out or, or can sometimes create a, an entire DNA hypersensitive site. Okay, so now we have a measure of looking at sort of the function of variants, but then we could also just take now and look at footprints more broadly and ask how regulatory of genetic variation, just generically, but I mean by that is, is just human variation that lands in regulatory DNA, not otherwise specified, uh, looks. And, and doing this right today, again, is a vastly different picture than a few years ago, because what we can do is we can go to, you know, things like the human variation server, and we can pull out data from, you know, 70 or 80,000 whole genomes, and of course, there, there are even bigger collections, uh, some of them centered very close to here, uh, which, which are, you know, putting together even bigger sets that are, that are uh, going to be out there, but just take in the human variation server, right, which is, and, and I think that the, 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 the public version that you can put through and do imputation on is maybe, I don't know, 65, 75,000 individuals, well, that has 430 30 million unique variants that you can put on the human genome, and you, for each of those, you have the frequency in terms of the number of, the, of chromosomes that, that they saw that variant in, right? So you have this enormously rich picture. And then now, so what that means is if you kind of do the math and resolve it down, it means that, that the average uh, DNA hypersensitive site or piece of, you know, annotated regulatory DNA in the genome has dozens and dozens of, of variants in it. And so it's really high density, so this allows us for the first time to ask the question, how exactly is human variation at all distributed relative to the features that we see in regulatory DNA? And when you do this, you actually find something quite remarkable. And, and, uh, and that is that, so what I'm gonna show you is a plot of just looking um, in, I'm gonna center on transcription factor footprints, and then I'm just gonna dial in the variants, all, all, all the variants from the, from the top med human variation set, which is done actually, what I'm gonna show you here, from about 60,000 individuals. And you get a plot that looks like this. So, um, and this is, this is pi, and here we're centering on footprints. So what this means is that, that human variation itself is actually uh, biased towards the places in the genome where transcription factors are binding. And this is something that, I mean, 
there are many, we have many hypotheses as to why this uh, is the case. Uh, there, there's an important uh, effect of certain types of, uh, of nucleotide and dinucleotide combinations, which have been sort of exhaustively corrected for in, in, in this picture. But it suggests then that there is an overall propensity for variation as it arises in humans to affect gene regulation. And this is something that, this is summing all alleles, but I can look at, uh, at alleles that are uh, of, uh, uh, that, that are, you know, of greater than 1% frequency that, uh, or, you know, or are quite rare, and, and you see the same phenomenon. So it's across the entire uh, spectrum of, uh, of allele frequencies. Um, okay, so that's just variation itself. Now, when we looked previously at, at uh, GWAS data, and so GWAS data, again, have been increasing greatly in their, uh, in their numerosity uh, and also their accuracy um, over the last several years. And, and when we looked previously, we were unable really to detect good relationships between the uh, variants and the transcription factor occupancy sites and the footprints. And there have even been you know, papers in high-profile journals saying, oh, you know, that the, the SNPs fall outside of motifs or this or that. Well, actually now we can go back and say, look, We've got really good idea of exactly where the footprints are, and, and we have all this variation. We have all these great GWAS stuff. What does this look like today? And, and that picture uh, looks like this. So if you just look at the enrichment um, versus matched, you know, uh, 1,000 genomes variants from, from just GWAS catalog SNPs. I'm not even going to go into individual studies, and, and you, you can say what you want about the, 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 the quality of the GWAS catalog. All I can tell you is it's a lot better now than it used to be, but it, 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 and, but it has a lot of, you know, a lot of stuff. But if you look again, this is looking at stuff in regulatory, it's sort of in G, DH, uh, DHSs themselves. And then here what we're looking at is, the, is sort of the strength of the footprint. This is kind of the posterior probability of calling them, but just think about it, the strength. So as the strength of the footprint increases here, that the, uh, that the fold enrichment of GWAS variants in footprints uh, is, is actually increasing as well. Um, and you can also look at this from the perspective of SNP heritability. Uh, and so now we can look at, let's say, SNP heritability um, and, uh, and, and looking, um, and this is actually from some blood cell traits, uh, probably from uh, Nicole Saranza's uh, uh, data, um, and looking for the enrichment there in, uh, in say, uh, DHSs um, uh, globally within the footprint, so it's much higher, but then when you get into lymphoid cells, again, you still have that boost, and the same thing is true with erythroid cells. So now, you know, we basically have the global picture here is that the framework exists now uh, for much more comprehensive, accurate, and informative integration of the genetic variation uh, and uh, the nucleotide resolution uh, DNA accessibility data that are out there. Okay. So now I'm going to shift to part two, uh, and this will be a big shift, a <laughs> very big shift, um, because we are going to, we are going to uh, uh, take a step way back um, and talk about um, actually intervening in the genome. So one of the, you know, the, one of the things out there right now is not only trying to solve all the genetic variation and what, what it does, but kind of a key piece of that is understanding, okay, I have a genetic variant and I'm in a regulatory element, and I want to be able to uh, um, then understand what is the possible mechanism of, of effect. And the first thing I need to answer is, what gene is that regulatory element talking to? Okay, so, so this is now, you know, probably you know, public enemy number one in the, uh, in, in, uh, the functional genomic space is connecting all of the elements to all of the genes that they, that they regulate. And, and there are a variety of strategies that they're employed, being employed to do that um, from, you know, and, uh, and featuring in these strategies are uh, functional genomic interventions, knockouts or ways to kind of repress or in some cases activate uh, the function of regulatory elements to do something to uh, uh, either themselves or a target gene, and this is true for enhancers, promoters, uh, et cetera. And so one of the things that we, um, you know, one, one wants to be able to do in terms of handling the regulatory DNA uh, is to be able to manipulate it precisely to do what you want to do. 
want it to do. Okay, so this is what I'm gonna kind of focus on here, um, which is programming gene regulation. And when we do that, I, I, I think about, there's a couple different ways of levels of the, where you can intervene here. Um, and so, you know, this is just a simple cartoon uh, and, and, and probably uh, 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 various people at the meeting can put themselves in different, in different kind of boxes here. Uh, you study variation, you study chromatin, you study epigenome machinery, transcription factors. Uh, but, but, you know, this is kind of a simple way of how it works. You've got re the regulatory DNA, the factors Bind, they interact, you know, through through uh, interaction domains, and 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 sort of. Uh, they recruit components of the epigenome machinery, it modifies uh, surrounding nucleosomes, modifies DNA, et cetera. So you've got this kind of machine going on. Um, and, and so when we want to intervene with the regulatory DNA, we use nucleases. Uh, and when we want to intervene with the uh, epigenome machinery, um, we use uh, molecules that um, uh, that, that essentially can co-opt the function, uh, or not co-opt, but they can mimic in some way the function of native transcription factors. Um, and, and, uh, and I'm gonna call these, and I'm gonna focus on uh, what I'll call synthetic transcription factors. I am gonna say something a little bit about what, I, what a transcription factor I think really is. Uh, and, um, but, but the bottom line is, is that you know, what, we are, what we're talking about with these molecules is something that has a DNA recognition domain and also a functional uh, domain. And, what, and that creates an effector and then we can use that effector to, uh, 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 to modulate things. I'm gonna focus uh, the rest of the talk on this piece up here and not on, uh, on nucleases that, uh, that, that target regulatory DNA, but really on trying to target the, uh, the sort of the machinery that's there and to be able to manipulate it in a, um, uh, in a facile way. And so that has to do really uh, with how you select and design the molecules you're gonna use to intervene to achieve an outcome such as turning a gene on, an element off, or a gene on, et cetera. Okay. So and these, are, these molecules are editing effectors. And when we think about editing effectors, whether you're doing sort of nucleases or, 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 uh, uh, or, these, or um, uh, synthetic transcription factor type applications, these are kind of the, 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 uh, the deck of cards that, that you can normally choose from, um, at least conceptually. Uh, zinc fingers were, were sort of the first thing out of the gate, um, and actually, uh, I, I should say, here I've illustrated zinc finger nucleases, I should say actually that zinc fingers, the first um, uh, effector was actually not a nuclease. The nucleases were invented afterwards. The first thing that was out were zinc finger transcription factors that were mimicking normal factors. So zinc finger proteins that had uh, uh, repressor activator domains, et cetera. Um, then there are uh, the next thing that was kind of discovered with it were the tal effector nucleases. Uh, and then, of course, uh, this, uh, this molecule here needs no introduction. Um, and, but there, there's kind of a fundamental difference about these molecules and how they interact that make, uh, it's kind of like Sesame Street, that there's one of these here that is not the best thing you would use if you're gonna try to intervene in regulatory DNA. And if you look at, uh, in terms of the recognition, when, you know, what, what zinc fingers are doing, they're basically now, they're interacting. So the key thing is zinc fingers, and, and this is for this cartoon was for tail ends, but let's just call it tail proteins, uh, are um, uh, basically interact with DNA, double-stranded DNA as the template, right? So that's what a transcription factor does. Um, whereas uh, our little bacterial friend here uh, comes in and you know, unwinds uh, the DNA and, and does all kinds of, uh, kinds of stuff to it. And so what, when you're looking at this you know, in, in terms of, of co-crystal structures, you've got these guys just uh, flopping in, in, and laying nicely in the minor in the sorry, the major groove, um, and then but you know with Cas9 you've got you know you've got unwinding, you've got the uh, uh, you've got the guide template, and it's, it's a completely different mode of interaction. And it basically, if you're a regulatory element here, you are blown apart uh, when 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 the big spaceship lands. Okay, and uh, and and so what that means uh, is that that as a modality it's not the most optimal thing to use to try to intervene in regulatory DNA. The other thing about these molecules 
is that you, they essentially have uh, infinite design density. So you can design them really to any sequence you want in the, uh, uh, in the human genome, um, and that's not something that you can do with, uh, with certainly with SpyCast9, uh, where you can target about 10 or 11% of the bases uh, in all the interesting regions. Okay, so um, what we did is settling on the fact that we need synthetic transcription factors. We, we had to build a platform to, uh, to make these guys. Uh, and um, so we, you know, we essentially have, uh, have geared up using a, uh, 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 a liquid nanodroplet system, um, a way of assembling uh, DNA targeting domains, and this is using the tail effector system. So you, you've got you know, one, one, ascent, one, one domain, uh, one repeat domain recognizes each base. So if you want to uh, uh, assemble something, a DNA binding domain that recognizes 20 bases, you've got 20 things to assemble. Uh, it turns out they're super repetitive. They only differ from each uh, by two amino acids. Um, and then you want to be able to add some other component. Right? I'm going to make a transcription factor, DNA binding domain, and I'm going to put a functional domain. And I can put, well, let's say if I want to make a nuclease, I put, I put one of these you know, kind of domains, uh, and, 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 et cetera. But, but in terms of the synthesis now, we can sort of assemble all this stuff uh, using a liquid droplet platform. Um, and what's nice about, uh, about the, the approach is that it gives a single product synthesis. So what you get out at the end, it's exactly what you order from the beginning. It's really parallel. It's really low cost. So it turns out that here we are in you know, November 2019, and you can make these things for about the price of a guide RNA. Um, and, uh, and that means that, you know, if I want to make a nuclease, I get a DNA binding domain, I hook it to a nuclease domain, then there's a, uh, there's a nuclease, I can make a, you know, a repressor by having a DNA binding domain and, you know, hooking it to crab, or let's say I want to image where things are going, well, I can hook it to one of these, uh, one of these imaging, you know, tags, et cetera. Okay. So, um, oops, sorry, one of my slides is... I'm out of whack here. Okay. So, uh, so getting back now to this picture, so we can make we can make these uh, uh, we can make these actors, uh, and then we want to be able to uh, to program gene expression with them. Okay. So, um, so in the big picture. What I'm going to tell you is that you can design, and I'm going to focus here on repressors, but you can imagine the paradigm is going to, is going to expand. Um, what I'm going to talk about is the fact that you, of course, can use these to achieve an outcome like, uh, like repression. But what I'm going to show you is that everything that has happened in the literature to date has not uh, taken account of one critical factor, and that is the position at which you are delivering your, uh, uh, your, your functional domain. There's a reason why transcription factors have binding sites that are at specific spots in, in the genome, uh, and, and it turns out that it makes an enormous difference. Um, and uh, so what I'm going to show you is that, you know, as a, as a system, that, there, that the sort of the nucleotide level view of this is incredibly important in design and regulation, and I'm going to do this using a paradigm of just repressing a gene by targeting its, uh, its promoter. Um, I'm also going to show you some other remarkable features of this is that once you kind of figure that out, um, you can reliably uh, 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 get into a world where transiently expressing these molecules uh, can give you durable, mitotically heritable effects that can persist for dozens and dozens of cell doublings, uh, you know, for, for days or weeks. Uh, uh, and, 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 uh, and I'm also going to show you that, that these things are incredibly potent and they can be multiplexed almost seamlessly. Uh, and, uh, and, and also, remarkably, uh, that they have uh, aspects of temporal control that has to do with what, what uh, molecule you deliver. Okay, so if I want to go, and that's kind of the key concept uh, up front, is that not every site in the genome is created equal for doing this, and I'm going to just zoom into a promoter, um, and, and then I'm going to take one of these little molecules here, it's got a DNA binding domain and a crab repressor, and I'm going to tile it across there, and I'm going to look at repression of the gene, and you get a picture that kind of looks like this. So the gene uh, is, uh, anybody who does anything in immunotherapy will recognize that this is a PD-1 gene, um, and, and so this is the, uh, this is the, uh, 
this is the percent of PD-1 positive cells. So these are things that don't really do anything. Uh, and then, you know, so we've got something out here that kind of represses a little bit coming along. Uh, but then you, you clearly have a couple of sites where if I park the repressor there, I am, uh, I, I'm actually getting an effect. Um, and, and you can see that effect, and this is looking at, uh, uh, this is a cell surface marker, but you can look at the RNA level, et cetera. But if I go to another gene, and so we, we, we call these, um, uh, these, these sites keyhole sites. And, and if I go to another gene, um, and I just tile here, just even a, a sort of a small tile around uh, one of the annotated transcription start sites, and then the other one um, here, I find in this case, uh, as I'm, I'm moving along, I hit this one spot um, where, where bang, uh, I get an incredible repressor. And so here, I, here I've sort of ordered everything by, uh, uh, by, by just ranked them by, by the strength of repression. So I, I kind of hit this one magic spot here. Um, and uh, let's say I'll go to another gene uh, here, and, and here I've got um, a bunch of these things that are targeting just a few base pairs off of each other. And again, so I'm in this spot right here where I get these incredible repressors, and then I move a few bases this way, and it doesn't work, uh, and, and I move over here, and it doesn't really work. And um, so when we first saw this, we thought, well, are we just getting lucky? Or are we really dealing with a base pair level phenomenon? Um, and so to answer that, thought about this and thought about the fact that like, when you're a uh, transcription factor and you're seeing DNA, you're seeing a molecule that's a helix, okay? And so as you move along DNA, you are taking whatever cargo you've got and for every base that you step forward, you are turning, right? So, so essentially what the, what, the, what the base pair position is doing is determining the presentation of the cargo. And so to test how important the base pair was, what we did is we focused back in one of those regions I showed you a minute ago, and we figured out a way to, to move the crab molecule one base at a time uh, across the genome, across this, across this stretch of nucleotides. And so here's this, uh, the promoter I was just showing you in lag three. So we basically anchor, we took advantage of the fact that these tail proteins, you can just you can just increase them, their DNA binding domain one at a time, and you can anchor them on one, on one site. And so, and then, so at, at every one of these positions, crab is moving along the genome one base at a time. So here's kind of a blow up of this, it's coming along. And then right here, then I'm measuring repression. And so as I go here, so this is, these are all repressed, 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 and then suddenly right in here, with this, with this group, so this transition between group four and five, we skip a few bases, but now we're down at a point where uh, in, in, uh, uh, in this group right here, where it's moving one base at a time, I go through these bases, and I've got these great repressors, and then suddenly I move from here to here, boom, the repression goes away. So it's one base pair, so it's a single nucleotide trigger. And we've done the same exercise over all those other spots where we see a repressor, where, you kind of, where we kind of got one at low resolution. You go in at high resolution and you find that it is on, uh, that, that the off or on trigger, depending on which direction you're going, is one base pair. And so that means that there is incredibly precise uh, control or recognition of the presentation of effector molecules within regulatory DNA. And that, so, and what, again, that means is if you don't have that, uh, that perspective, it's gonna be really difficult to interpret, to sort of interrogate. You're never gonna know what's a false negative uh, in terms of your experiments or in terms of, or in terms of looking at false, uh, uh, at, at false positives, too. Um, so the nice thing about these repressors is that you can, once you get them, uh, these magic spot repressors, once you're in one of these keyhole sites and you're at the, at the trigger zone, um, it turns out that these things are incredibly potent uh, and they can be uh, really easily multiplexed. So I can take, you know, let's say some cells and, and this is just some fax plots for, for people who are, I'm gonna do two different, uh, two different repressors here for these different genes um, that we fished out of, these, out of these keyholes and I put in repressor number one and I, you know, shut off 99.8% uh, of the, uh, the expression of the gene. Uh, here's repressor number two. I shut off whatever, 90, 94% of the expression of the gene. And then I electroporate them together and I get essentially the exact same results. In other words, they're behaving completely independently and they're so potent they come in there and they, they just, they do their job. 
The other magical thing that happens when you're in these incredibly specific sites is you get tremendous gene specificity. So if you go, and back to this original plot I showed you, and I take these, any repressor that had any effect here, and, and I do RNA-seq, um, I get a, and I ask what genes changed. I get a lot of genes changing for a lot of these spots, but it turns out in this case there was this one magic spot where, uh, where the only gene in the genome changed was the target gene. Um, and, and that's something that, that we, we've, we can do over and over again. And so there's that gene, and here are some of the other ones I've shown you. And this is a, uh, so this is a repressor, comes in, shuts the gene off, and this is now a, a uh, this is what a volcano plot looks like from space. Uh, and so this is the sort of the selectivity of the, uh, uh, of, of the repressor for that gene. In this case, again, here's a repressor. Uh, yeah, these are minus log, they're key values. <laughs> this is the repressor for this gene. And, and it turns out you see this guy floating up right here. That's because that there's a little halo of repression that is put on by, by crab, and it's bleeding into this, uh, this, this next door gene right there. That halo is about maybe two to three kilobases. Um, so the other remarkable thing about these molecules and about these magic spots is that a, is that a single strike leads to heritable repression. So I, I dump in the repressor, I can image it, it's gone completely in 48 hours. But then if I do this to cells and I put the cells in culture, then what happens is, so this gene actually, this, these, this gene, PD-1, if you stimulate the cells, it goes up and it kind of naturally goes down. That's the natural wild site. But here's the repressor coming in, it just stays shut off. And this is days post-transfection. Um, and the key thing here is that this, uh, this, once it's stimulated, these cells are dividing roughly every day. So you're at about 15, you know, 12 to 15 doublings by the time you're there. Um, and, and not only that, you can take these same uh, repressors and you can take these cells and you can put them into mice. Um, so they're being stimulated. And what you can show is that even after uh, roughly a month, you've got these repressed cells that are floating uh, around. So, um, so that's something it, that you can basically take now, and you know you can combine it with uh, uh, with, with CAR T cells. Uh, you know where you, where you can let's say uh, if you're doing therapy, you can repress genes and and you know improve uh, 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 improve effects because you're dealing with something that is um, uh, that is a durable effect. So you can put something onto a, a T cell, and you can put those T cells potentially into people, uh, and they can you know they can block immune checkpoints, uh, et cetera. So um, uh, well. With that, and just in looking at the time, I'm actually going to stop, um, and just want to thank uh, my. Uh, this is uh, uh, all the all the folks at at, at Altius that uh, have contributed to uh, uh, to various aspects of uh, of these projects. Um, it's very difficult to enumerate everybody. I did call out uh, Jeff Vierstra, uh, who's uh, uh, you know has really been spearheading all of the nucleotide resolution analyses. Uh, but uh, 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 Sean Green and Christy Charlotte and Matt Wilkin uh, are, are fellows and and uh, an investigator who uh, uh, really has spearheaded a lot of the. Uh, uh, the synthetic repressor and, and transcription factor work. So, thank you. Okay, well, thank you, John. That's wonderful. And lots of exciting and unexpected results there, I think. Thank you very much. So, so if I just um, kick off with one question. So, when, you, when you're um, trying to um, identify the consensus binding site for each of your different proteins, by analyzing many, many cells. Um, when you get something like the KLF family of proteins, can you actually distinguish between the different types of KLF proteins and say, oh, that's KLF4, not KLF1, or, or whatever? Can you do that? So to the extent, um, OK. Let's talk about the case in which we think we, we, we know we can, can do that. So if you have factors, and the factors have good recognition sequences, you, you can do that quite easily. Um, and, but, and, and the recognition sequences, thanks to a lot of efforts that have been going on, have gotten progressively better and better. And so there's actually an, a really nice set of recognition sequences that are out there right now. Many of these, when you look at them, they're like have super subtle differences between them. But it turns out that those small differences are magnified when you start looking over data at this scale. Right. Uh, and and so, 
so you can, so I, I think what there's ways of looking at this by saying that this is KLF this and this, and you can see that and you can track with expression, uh, you know, of those genes and make those kind of associations now because again, the data are so voluminous that, that you can do it. The other way is that you can now go into the data and they're so rich that you can cluster out so you can say, all right, here's the, the base KLF. How many other versions do I see in there? And then you can find those de novo, track them with expression of the genes and, and resolve that. That would so. be tremendously helpful. So any other, yes, so let's start there. Richard, Richard Safry from Melbourne, Australia. Congratulations on that tour de force for understanding the interaction between genetics um, and transcriptional factor regulation of genes. Um, my question is a bit tangential in that all the GWAS SNPs that are identified generally have very small effect sizes, and that's why you need such large sample sizes. So at a population level, what you're describing is very interesting, but do you ever think we're gonna to get to a stage where we understand how these things work at an individual level? I'm thinking specifically of epistasis. Yeah, I think there's possibly two different, uh, two, two different questions there. The first one is related to the genetic effect size. And I think this is something, um, I think there is a big, potentially big distinction between the genetic effect size and the effect that we measure when we look at, at regulation. Um, because we can find variants that have very low effect sizes genetically, but have really quite profound uh, effects on, on regulation. Um, and so, I mean, for example, let's say, you know, the, the, the BCL11A uh, paradigm, I mean, the original SNP that was, that had the high genetic effect size uh, is, is, turns out it's in a location that, yes, it works, but nearby there's some other SNPs that don't have very high effect sizes, but actually are pointing to, uh, to spots in regulation that have um, really important and profound effects. So I think the way I think of it is that the genetics provides, in those cases, provides kind of the smoke, and then when you can, then you can use that as a lever to go in and, and figure out what are the other positions that can give you insights into mechanism, and that's how you translate back to an individual. Um, epistasis is a whole different, uh, <laughs> I mean, that, that obviously attenuates the, uh, you know, the genetic uh, effects or, or can amplify the genetic effects uh, uh, in different ways, but, but that's, um, that's more complicated to, to, to deal with. Uh, <laughs> that's not a test tube phenomenon. So going back to the footprinting and the uh, uh, story that you saw, are the footprints much bigger than the actual recognition motifs that are found within them? And if so, are the GWAS hits that map to them preferentially still overlapping the motif? Or can they be on the outskirts that would be still within the footprint but outside of the motif? So, uh, the, so the answer is that the footprints are on average a little bit bigger than the recognition sequence, and that's, but that's exactly what you could expect when you, when you analyze it, when you line them up with all the crystal structures and everything, which we can do really well now because there's tons more structures. And, and um, so in terms of the distribution of the GWAS variants, they peak in the recognition sequence, but there are some that, are, that, you know, that trail out. And the and, effect and, size? And the, the effect order. size is, is in the core. The effect size tracks with the recognition sequence. Now, this doesn't mean that every variant falls there, right? There are still some that, that, that clearly have effects, right, that are falling outside of those sequences. So, you know, there, there, there must be something else that, that is, you know, that is being contacted there um, that, that is uh, outside of the recognition sequence. It's just not yielding a consensus. And so, you know, maybe parts of a, like there, you know, there are some zinc finger factors that recognize DNA shape rather than particular sequences that, you know, that can produce that, so. Okay, it was a great talk, thank you. So, uh, my question is that it was very useful uh, as a person who is doing the, a lot of like toxic, you compare the DNA seq and the toxic. Uh, comparison. For the talent usage, have you tried to use also Cas9 that uh, you can get the same repression with that region you see the uh, nucleotide resolution changes? Yeah, so, um, so regarding the former, I just want to make the comment that, that, uh, that, that TN5 and, and ATAC-seq is, is a great approach, but it's just you can't push it to nucleotide resolution. <laughs> With, the, with respect to the, then the second one with the Cas9, it's actually very, very analogous. It's a really, it's an easy tool to use, but you just can't get that resolution, right? Because if, if you cannot, so first of all, there's, there's two things that are going against you. Number one, there's the positioning, 
okay? So you only have uh, a PAM that's uh, on average in DNA hypersensitive sites of roughly 10% of the basis, okay? So right away you can't have a nucleotide resolution trigger. The second thing is that the, um, where you hook on, let's say with DCAS9, where you hook those molecules on is actually uh, a region that is, is not really tightly constrained, and so they can probably flop around, you know, uh, quite a bit. So um, if you look back at the, at the literature, nobody has really been able to find uh, any analogous spot. I don't think anybody has really hit a keyhole site with, uh, with, uh, with DCAS9 type repressors um, because, you know, you, know, you don't just see the, the, the complete knockout <laughs> that you get when you, yeah. when you hit one of those sites. Maybe one more thing. If you look at is the uh, memory effect of the repression, did you see that one? It's just after one time of repression, it's carry over through the cell cycle, or you just yeah, it's it's incredibly reliable. You can you can trigger it. Just it works every time in T cells. So, okay. and that's with that's with dynamically regulated non CPG island genes. There's no DNA methyltransferase. There's no anything. It's just just crab hitting. So.